program is called Living It Up because we want to lift you up, build you up, and in the end, we all want to go up. Well, uh, today, we're going to talk about an unusual subject, and that subject is things that are unusual in the scripture. And um, it just so happens that it works out that the, the three examples that I'm going to talk about today are women. And a lot of times I'm talking about men in the Bible, but today it's the women that we're going to talk about. Because you know what? There are so many times, even in the examples of Jesus in the Bible, that things were unusual. He was the most unusual human being ever. And of course, he was deity put in a human body. He wasn't born like you and I. He wasn't born like you and I in that he was human and human mother and father. He had, his father was God and his mother was a human. But he wanted to experience humanity so that he could say, I've walked where you are walking. I've been there. I feel what you feel. I experience what you experience. And in that walk, he could then be victorious and take away the keys of death, hell, and the grave from our enemies. And uh, we could be victorious in every situation because he said, be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. But anyway, Jesus was very unusual, very unusual. Now, some of the examples in the scriptures that I think of right off the bat, where people had to experience things that were unusual, were things like where Jesus took some dirt and spit in it and made mud and put it on somebody's eyes and spoke healing and their eyes were healed. So that's one example. I mean, that would be kind of unusual. You know, if somebody came up to you, I mean, if a minister did that nowadays, if, if I was in a meeting as an evangelist and I went up to someone and said, you know, don't mind me, I'm just going to put a little mud in your eye, okay? I'm going to spit in it first and make a little mud and put a little mud on your eyes. It would take a lot of faith to let somebody do that to you because, you know, we're so germ conscious, you know, we're doing the antibacterial hand stuff and we'd be thinking that's got germs in it. It's, you know, of course, Jesus has holy spit. His spit would not be like mine and yours. But that had to take a lot of faith to allow that to happen. Um, <clears throat> there were other instances where he told a man, take up your bed and walk. And he had to, by faith, rise up and just take up his bed and walk. And I could go on and on and on. Um, he, he had a man, you know, uh, do dip himself seven times in a river. And you know this man had probably, you know, been bathed and washed and everything before, and they've always used their water sources for bathing and everything. But this time he was at the command of the Lord Jesus Christ. So there's just a few examples of unusual things. And I'm here today to encourage you that sometimes we are going to have to walk an unusual walk. We're going to have to do things that are unusual. You know, I heard an old saying once, if you do what you did, you're going to get what you got. And we like to do routine. We like to stay in that routine. We like to stay in the flow. We want to go with the flow. We like to do the things the way we've always done it. We like to play the game the way we've always done it. You know, it's kind of interesting whenever you're playing, you know, cards or something and somebody comes in and, and you're playing a game and they are used to playing it by a different set of rules. And I have found in my life's experience that when I introduce something and want to play it a certain way and somebody else isn't used to playing by those rules, it's like hard for them. They want to impose on you their rules. They want to impose on you to do it a different way. Now, I'm pretty easy. I'm not a big game player. So to me, it's just, it's all a game. I don't have a problem with that. I'm totally go with the flow in the games. It's like, okay, we'll play that way, you know. But there are some people that are not. I have played with people, especially choleric type personalities. You know, there's four main flow 
uh, directions of personality types. And the clerics, you know, they're the, the ones that want to be in charge, you know, large and in charge, they're happy. And those are the ones that maybe have a little more trouble with altering the rules of the game. And uh, we've all got family members that are choleric, okay, or friends. But um, we, we sometimes have to just go with the flow and do things in an unusual way, like be willing to play the game differently. And so um, a, a couple of the examples that came to my mind um, were one was uh, women who did amazing and unusual things. Uh, one of them was JL. And JL, I'm going to read just a little bit about JL here in the book of Judges. Um, JL had to uh, defend her country in just a little bit of an unusual way. And um, JL was working with uh, Deborah and the children of Israel and she, her assignment, one of the enemy came to her tent and what she had to do was he came in and he asked for some, a drink and she said, um, I'm going to paraphrase it here instead of reading the whole story, but um, JL you know, had to not be afraid, first of all. I mean, women usually are kind of afraid if they have to deal with a man as an opponent, as an enemy. And he came in and wanted, uh, he said in verse 19, and this is Judges chapter 4, he said to her, Give me, I pray thee, a little water to drink, for I am thirsty. And she opened a bottle of milk and gave him a drink and covered him. Now, she was smart because milk, have you ever had milk before bedtime? I mean, like milk totally makes you like relax. And there's something about milk that's soothing. That's why we like milk and cookies or just a glass of milk before you go to bed. Um, babies, they'll drink their bottle and drink the milk and then they get all sleepy. There's something, it's a comfort food, a comfort drink and um, very nourishing. So she was wise. Instead of drawing water, plain old water, she gave him milk and covered him up. She was like, oh, here, let me get you some milk. Let me cover you up. And of course, this was the enemy and, and the enemy was there to take their lives. This was the opposing enemy. And he said to her, stand in the door of the tent and it shall be when any man doth come and inquire of thee and say, Is there any man here? Thou shalt say no. Then Jael, Heber's wife, took a nail of the tent and took a hammer in her hand and went softly unto him and smote the nail into his temples and fastened it into the ground, for he was fast asleep and weary. So she was faced with an, a huge, unusual experience here. She's got the enemy in her tent. I mean, you know, the, she had to take unusual measures. This is very unusual. Your average Jewish woman probably did not ever have to experience anything like this. But sometimes, you know, we have to do unusual things. And sometimes there's things in our life that it's going to take unusual measures to get out of. Now, I'm not promoting. I'm not promoting this kind of activity. I'm thinking about dying to self. Sometimes we have things in our nature that we're going to have to like totally drive a stake in those things. We're going to have to nail it to the ground. We're going to have to, maybe your habit is overeating. Maybe you have a, a smoking habit. Maybe it's, um, you know, gambling, you know, whatever the habit is. There are strong habits that people have in their lives that you can't just mamsy pamsy around with. These enemies are big enemies. I mean, gambling addictions will take all your income and leave you with no grocery money. Um, smoking could bring lung cancer. Even overeating can cause heart problems, diabetes. So there comes a time in our life where their serious measure has to be taken and in unusual ways, okay? And sometimes we have to do the replacement therapy. Okay, every time I'm tempted to do this habit, what am I gonna replace it with? And how am I going to deal with that habit? And sometimes it'll be very, very unusual ways. 
I know someone who quit smoking that wrote a Bible verse and rolled it up on the paper and put it in the cigarette, empty cigarette box and did several scriptures in there. And every time they were tempted to smoke, pulled it out, read the scripture about overcoming. There's lots of scriptures about how we are victorious. We are overcomers through Christ and how, you know, he has already overcome everything that you are going to walk through. So every time you're tempted, pull it out, read the scripture. You know, um, replacement therapy is great therapy. Replacing things with other good things. Taking the negative things and replacing them with good things. But JL had to think of an unusual thing here. Now, we're blessed because we can seek the Lord. We can just shoot a prayer in a second. Holy Spirit will not leave us answerless. If you shoot a prayer from your heart, not out loud with your mouth, but in your silence, shoot a prayer up to the Lord, he immediately comes back. He's in you. He's not up. He's in you. The Holy Spirit, once you're born again and you ask Christ to come into your heart, there's a resident spirit. It's his spirit married with your spirit. And they come together and now you have a Holy Spirit inside of you that's not your flesh. It's not you. It's you and him married together. And now that spirit is able to quicken things. The Holy Spirit will quicken to you. You are now his offspring. And so he will be quick to deliver an answer when you need it. The scripture says, even before you ask, I will answer you. So you don't even have time to get the question out. The minute your heart turns toward a thought that's a need or a question, he will answer you before you even could voice the words if you're seeking him. And um, I've shared many times about my experience of, you know, him coming to the rescue right when I needed it. So that's one story, JL. Boy, she had to, she had to use unusual means. And then, um, you know, Deborah, right in that same chap chapter and in that book, is another example that I really hadn't planned to talk about. But, you know, Deborah uh, the, was a captain, and her subjugate person under her that was under her said, yeah, I, I'm, I, can't, I don't have the confidence. I am not even going to go into battle if you don't go with. And so she was like, all right, let's do this thing. And she had to, she was used to staying back behind the scenes. Most of your generals in the army aren't out on the scene. They're like behind the scenes, you know, and um, they're giving the directions from behind the scenes. And she had to dress for battle and go out on the battlefield. And so she had to take unusual measures also. But another person uh, that came to my mind when I was thinking about unusual measures, you know, um, is Rahab. And Rahab is talked about in the book of Joshua. And so I don't know that I'll read all of it, but we may, we may reference it a little bit. Um, you can go to Joshua chapter 6 and read that whole entire story. But I'm going to give you that story in a nutshell for the sake of time. And uh, what happened to Rahab was, again, because life's full of battle, that they were in the midst of a battle. And um, there were spies, the children of Israel, which is God's people, uh, you know, Jesus was born a Jew. He was born in uh, into the the Jewish family, and Israel was his home nation. And those are God's chosen people, and they are. There's just an anointing. I don't know if you've ever been around Jewish people very long, but even the ones who have not yet accepted Christ as Savior and been born again, if you're around the Jewish people, they are chosen by God and have a very, very special anointing on them. I just love any experiences I get to have with Jewish people. Um, I was at a mall not too long ago and walking down the mall and there were two people uh, standing at the edge of a store uh, with perfumes uh, offering you an opportunity to spray the perfume on and see what it smelled like on yourself. And um, they just, I knew immediately they were Jewish. 
And I just thought, whoa, I want to talk to these people. And there was something that drew me to them. I really, really wanted to talk to them. So I stopped and I said, well, can I try, you know? And they were immediately were trying to get me to try it. And I said, oh, I'd love to. So I did. And uh, it was quite nice perfume, actually. But so anyway, I began to say, are you Jewish? And they said, yes, we are. And I said, well, you realize, don't you, that you're God's chosen people? And they both immediately said, yes, we know. And that's what I love about them. They're so confident in their self. I mean, you will not find hardly a Jewish person that is not confident in their self, which I love that. I mean, God wants us to be confident in ourselves. I mean, God, give, he has given us everything. He gave us a, a beautiful body. We're born with, you know, a body that's, healthy, you know, for the most part. Some of us may have struggles. Some of us may have more struggles than others. But he give us a body. And so he's given us life. He gave us a savior so that we could have eternal life. Because, you know, this is just boot camp, okay? You know, when you go to boot camp, it's like six weeks and then you're in the, you're in the army for years. Well, that's the way this earth is going to seem. It's going to seem so short and so quick because eternity is forever ever. We can't even fathom that. We can't even fathom being there 10,000 years and we've only just begun to sing. But eternity is forever. So this is just boot camp. But those people have confidence and God wants us to have confidence in ourselves. And so he's constantly trying to build us up and encourage us in the Lord. And that's why I love to be an encourager. I love to encourage people is because God himself, Jesus has encouraged me so much. He's brought me so far. And so anyway, I carried on a conversation with this Jewish young man and Jewish young lady and was able to share with them just a little bit about my experience with Jesus as Messiah and how I know he lives in me and he talks to me and we have this sweet communion and but you will find that there is an anointing so any chance you get to talk to a Jewish person it's a it's an exciting thing I just love it so anyway back to Rahab there was these spies that were fighting for Israel and they'd been sent in to spy out the land well Rahab hid these spies and they said, if you hide us, we will see that you and your entire family, if you'll have them all in the house. Now, they have to be in the house. That's a whole new sermon in itself. They have to be in the house. We've got to be a part of God's kingdom to, to walk with him, to hear his voice, to uh, be born again. You've got to invite him in. And you got to dwell with him and, and in his kingdom. And the kingdom of God is within me, the scripture says. Once you invite Christ into your life, then his kingdom resides in you and you have power. But anyway, Rahab was given this assignment. They said, if you will hide us, because the enemy was going house to house. And they were going house to house and she was putting her life on the line. And, you know, J.L. did too. She put her life on the line. He could have woke up and he would have overpowered her. He was stronger. But Rahab had to even go so far as to hide them and say, no, I don't know. You know, I don't know where they went. Or I think they went that way. She said, I think they went that way. And so when she, she had hidden them. Now, that's just kind of mind blowing, you know, that God then came back and honored Rahab and her entire family was saved. And you know, uh, later on she has a lineage uh, in the inheritance, you know, of the kingdom. She, her lineage went on and um, way on down the line, you know, she was part of the lineage that birthed Jesus, her lineage. So, you know, <clears throat> Rahab, did an unusual thing. Rahab did an unusual thing. And in your life today, I just feel like there's people out there that are watching, that you're watching and you're thinking, but I can't break out. Maybe you're feeling stuck today. 
Maybe you're feeling stuck and you feel like there is no way out of your situation. Maybe it's a really unusual situation. And maybe you're feeling you're in bondage and there's no way out. But I promise you, the God of the universe is so full of truth and so full of creativity. You know, he created the whole earth. He created the brain. Look how complex the brain is. Look at scientists, how complex they are. And yet he created every scientific thing that exists. God is so complex that I don't care what your situation is. He has a way out for you. There is a way out of your trauma. There is a way out of your prisoner situation, your prisoner feeling. You feel trapped. There's maybe a a ceiling that you feel like you cannot break through that ceiling. But I promise you, there is a way to break through that silent ceiling that is holding you in. It's like I heard Chuck Pierce say recently that somebody's breaking through a glass ceiling. There's a glass ceiling and you're breaking through that glass ceiling. And that's what I feel like today is those of you who feel like there's no way out, I'm here to say there is, there is nothing, nothing impossible with God. The scripture says there is nothing impossible with God. All things are possible with God. So back to Rahab. So Rahab does this unusual thing. She hides them. She gets her whole family saved. Her whole family is redeemed and, you know, restored Amazing, you know, so and and there's other examples in the Bible that when you get born again, you know, there was a jailer when Paul and Silas were in jail, uh, they they were singing at midnight. Paul was indestructible. His faith was so strong. He had the supernatural gift of faith. God had imparted to him a supernatural gift of faith. His faith was so strong that no matter what the enemy threw at him, God provided a way out. It wasn't his own doing. It wasn't that he was so unusual. It was that God is so unusual. God is so unusual that he has a way of making an unusual answer for your unusual situation. And so Paul and Silas, no matter what hit Paul and came at him, he broke through it. You know, he was... um, shipwrecked and he held on to a piece of wood until he got to shore. He gets to shore, he's snake bitten. Um, you know, the Bible says, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. It says you'll drink deadly poison and it will not harm you. If you have faith, if you have faith and you will put that faith in God and claim the name of Jesus Christ, there's power in the name. The scriptures are full of scriptures that say there's power in the name. You can use your own name, but it ain't going to help you in the time of trouble. But there's power in the name of Jesus, Yeshua. The name of Jesus has power. And so anyway, he believed in God. And no matter what came at him, he just believed God and what he overcome every situation shipwreck because of storms the storms took him down but uh he was singing at midnight here they were they were in prison him and silas and had been in prison for speaking uh, the gospel speaking the truth once he was radically saved struck blind at first a light appeared to him struck him blind temporarily uh showed him a vision of god and jesus christ uh, the coming christ to come And he was radically saved, born again. And uh, from that moment on, he was not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, the Bible tells us. And so he went everywhere. Now, this was a man who had killed Christians. That was his whole life. Paul's whole life was he was a very religious man. And religious people are mean. They killed Jesus. Paul was very religious. And he had killed people in his past. Um, Saul was his name. He became Paul. And so he had been a very mean and religious person who killed Christians. In fact, so many so that the Christians were scared of him. A lot of people were too scared to go around him at first. They were like, "Uh uh-uh, we don't want anything to do with him. He kills Christians. Are you crazy? We are not going to hang out with him. He kills Christians. But he was so radically saved, he repented. And see, God is able to even forgive 
murder. God, his grace is so huge. His grace is so magnificent. His grace is so unusual that he is able to forgive murder. You know, David in the Bible was a man after God's own heart. And yet he, when he committed adultery with Bathsheba, he also sent Bathsheba's husband out to the front lines. They put him out on the front lines and got him killed. So he had murder in his heart. He didn't actually do it with his hands, but he did it with his heart. And yet God forgave him. Now, he did lose a son. There was a, there was a price he paid. He paid a great price um, for his sins in general. But um, he was forgiven. He was radically redeemed. And God continued to love him. And God continued to forgive him. So maybe you're out there today. And you're just feeling like, I've done too much. I've done too much. It's, I've gone too far. I've gone too far. I've crossed over the line. I'm here to tell you no. If you have a desire, if you have a desire for God, then you haven't gone too far. Because, you know, the scripture tells us that you can't even be drawn to God except the Holy Spirit draw you. You can't even be drawn to God unless the Holy Spirit is wooing you. So if you have a desire at all to know this Jesus, then you haven't gone too far. And uh, that's an exciting thing that he is able to forgive. You know, he tells us as human beings, uh, saved, radically saved, and now eternal human beings, but he tells us to forgive 70 times 7. And that scripture reference, if you get in there and break that down into the original, um, you know, Greek, it, in the New Testament, it means 70 times 7 in one day because his mercies are new every morning. Every morning you can have a clean slate. So I encourage people, before you go to bed every night, clean your slate. Say, God, I fell short today in some ways of what I would have liked to have done for you. But I ask you to forgive me and just anything I did today that was not bringing glory or that was a sin, which just means miss the mark. Any area that I missed the mark of what I could have done, I'm asking your forgiveness, God. I'm asking in the name of Jesus that just wipe my slate clean. And you know what? He'll do it. And the word says his mercies are new every morning. So his anger, it says, only lasts for a season but joy comes in the morning. So, you know, um, another person is Esther in the Bible that had to do some unusual, unusual things. So we're going to talk about Esther in just a moment. Um, but since I'm at this point, I just want to say a prayer here. And if you're out there today, I just want you to, to just receive this prayer in your heart. It's not the words. It's not, I have the magic words. No, it's our heart. I want you just to say, Heavenly Father, I open my heart up. I peel back the me. And I'm asking for you to come in with your light and your love and wash me clean of my own selfishness. We're all born selfish. You look at any newborn baby, you look at any one-year-old, they're selfish. We have a selfish nature. But Jesus, we ask you to forgive us. We ask you to transform our selfish nature into your light and your love and into the person of Jesus Christ joined with us. So we ask for Jesus to come into our heart and join with us. We love you, Jesus, and we want you shining out of us instead of our selfish, selfish nature. And you know what? He does that. He really does it. I can personally testify to you because he's walked with me since I was 17 years old 
I've walked with the Lord in radical ways and seen him do radical things. And he walks with me and he talks with me. And you know that little prayer you prayed? It doesn't seem like all that much. But you know when you get married, you just say a few sentences like I will and I do. And you're radically changed. Well, until next time, this is Deborah Holt, living it up on Up TV. God bless you. Thank you.